Oh, I made this post yesterday. Started off so. I came up with this theory. Um, back in probably around 20. I don't know. I got a poem that I wrote about Morocco. Maybe 2016, 2017. So, in my understanding of reality, there's no differentiation between the political left and the political right. Like, one example is, um, it came out late in Obama's administration, towards the end of his administration, that him and the Bush administration were actually communicating transitional plans in uh, summertime of 2008. So he hadn't even been, I don't know, he hadn't been chosen as the, uh, as a front runner for the Democratic Party yet. But they were already in communication planning out him being, how he was going to take, transition into the White House. So that got buried because the polarization of the psyche and the ego as far as me, 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 and uh, team-wise, obedience to authority, as Stanley Milgram study shows, uh, people can't process that type of information. They need to believe that the person that they've deemed to be different than the person that they deem to be bad is good. Otherwise, the conflict that's created is, does that mean that I'm bad? So rather than address that, introspective um, contradiction they just it's called crass ignorance they, they just dismiss it intentionally so um, based on that when Trump kept coming around with uh, Obama is uh, Ho Trump, uh, Barack Hussein Obama Barack Hussein Obama so in my narrative since they're not enemies, they're allies, I wanted to find out how Hussein could be a compliment as opposed to an insult. Now they never ever, as far as I could see, no one ever said it in this new stuff here too. They just were very generalized and saying that um, Trump, if they discussed it at all, they tried to say that Trump was associating Obama as a Muslim. Uh, on a deeper level, I believe that they were that um, the they, that on a mass manipulative level, it was for the right at least. It was directly associating Barack Hussein, Barack Hussein Obama with Saddam Hussein, as far as a dictator. Because they were you got to remember. And they're still they're going back to this now with this new election, uh, like because um, Trump keeps gaffing and mentioning Obama as president instead of Biden. So the right, rather than accept that he's just as old and senile as Biden, have taken to oh these are coded messages from our our leader who's telling us that in reality Obama's still in control because they had gone so far as to say that Obama was the Antichrist and he was the, all this kind of stuff like that. Um, so, like, basically calling him Hussein was saying he's going to be a dictator like Saddam. He's going to do to America what Saddam did to Iraq. Get it? So, as I delved deeper, um, I ended up finding out the uh, cross-referencing basically it's going to get complicated but for the most part is I ended up finding out that there's a lot of significance between Morocco and Western civilization a lot deeper ties than one could probably imagine in the quickest analysis I can say it like this which is the most absurd thing you could possibly hear and that is that Morocco is the most powerful country in the world. Um, so, this is Hussein to show you how it pans out. And uh, the diminutive of Hassan, meaning good, handsome, or beautiful, 
What's funny about this too is uh, today there was a guy towards the end of the day. I closed at one o'clock, and uh, there's a guy that came by at like twelve thirty-five or twelve forty, and he ordered something. And he said, I, "You know, what's your name for when I called the order?" He's like Hassan. I said, "Oh, I just learned what that means yesterday." And he just nods his head like you know, dismissively, like yeah, whatever. And I was like, "Yeah, handsome, good looking." And he looked up, like, "Oh, really?" And his eyebrows, you know cocked his chin and everything because he was uh, shocked as yeah he thought I was bullshitting huh um so I get into this just to show that uh because I, what I ended up doing is I ended up coming up with this theory I made a mistake I thought that the king of Morocco name was Hussein the fifth I don't know why I came up with that but I just came up with that that turned out to be completely wrong completely wrong his name is Muhammad. I didn't find. I didn't make that correction until about two years ago, but I didn't even. I wasn't gonna change it because I wanted to stick to my thing, and I was still saying that. Um, that I'm not saying that. I never meant that Barack Obama was born in Morocco. I'm just saying that Morocco's significance in all of Western civilization as the founder of Western civilization, as we know it, the power elite go out of their way to pay homage to this entity, this geopolitical entity. Um, and on that, even though I say there's, there's more significance to the, like the name, it turns out that Hassan and Hussein are two different people that are grandsons of supposedly grand direct descendant grandsons of the prophet Muhammad from Islam first it was Hassan and then it was Hussein um, okay so why does Trump regular middle name it makes Obama seem vaguely Muslim and hopefully connects him with the people's mind of Saddam Hussein see there you go so this, but this is not uh, mainstream media that's Quora so I'm not the only one that thought it. Uh, Trump main, Trump's main problem with Obama is Obama was uh, arrogant enough to prove that he wasn't born in Kenya, making Trump look like a whatever. So Trump not being born in Kenya uh, it doesn't matter to me where he was born. Um, oh, so the conspiracy theory that comes out of him not being born in the United States is connected directly to Trump's Columbia University transcripts which have his name as Bor Barry Sorotero, which is the name that he was given at six years old uh, after his mom, his dad died, I think when he was two or left the picture when he was two. His mom remarried uh, when he was six to um, some guy, an Indonesian guy who worked for Unical in Indonesia. After the genocide, the military government that did all the killing started contracting out the land of the people that they just got done killing so there was no one on the land anymore so they wanted to do something with it so they started selling it or contracting it out to American corporations and Barack Hussein Obama or Barry Sorotero at the time his dad um, worked for Unical and was helping broker you know deals between the Indonesian genocidal government and the uh, blood oil thirsty greedy uh, uh, US corporations that wanted to profit off of the genocide and uh, he moved to Indonesia at six years old so so here's a current king Mohammed as Sadis Sadis born the 21st October 1963 He's king of Morocco a member of the Alawi Dynasty. He ascended to the throne on the 23rd of July. I can't even get into that. That's my own number. Upon the death of his father, Hassan II. And that's where I messed up. So his dad was Hassan II. Which is, again, goes to Hussein. So Now, the interesting thing about Hassan, his, that's his father. So look how this guy took over. Um, he became king in... Oh, I don't have it right here. Oh, here we go. So 
it's not saying that he's the richest. You see, 8.2 billion, maybe. All right, so then uh, I ended up finding this uh, Barack Obama statement where he gave a speech at, in Morocco. And um, I listened to the whole speech, and there were points in it that resonated with my whole thing, the way he was, like, it's you would think it's a little itty-bitty country, but he was really using the maximum oratory skills that he has as the master orator or rhetorician um, that Obama was is and just laying it on heavy just like kissing ass the way I've seen it so um, oh just a little point right here in their meeting today at the White House President Obama and His Majesty King Mohammed the sixth reaffirmed the strong and mutually beneficial partnership and strategic alliance between the United States and the Kingdom of Morocco. The two leaders stressed that it's important to visit. It's, a, it's important this visit provides an opportunity to map out new and ambitious plans for the strategic partnership and pledge to advance our shared priorities of a secure, stable, and prosperous Maghreb, Africa, and Middle East. The two leaders emphasize our shared values, mutual trust, common interests, and strong friendship as reflected through our partnership. And then down here too, the President and His Majesty, the King, closed the meeting by emphasizing their shared commitment to the special and long-standing relationship between the United States and the Kingdom of Morocco, which in 1777 became the first nation to recognize the independence of the United States. Now this is from the uh, House Senate archives. Um, now the significant significance of that is that uh, the reason Morocco was so eager to acknowledge the United States as an independent was because the United States, or we, if you want to call us that, were the number one customer for slaves, African slaves, and Morocco was the number one purveyor of slaves. In both, that's the whole point of this. So, anyways, so um, then I came across this thing when I was making the post, uh, you know, just this that I thought was funny because it's it is I do take it as a joke but um, I just still take it as relevant and this goes all the way back to 2010 updated in 2011 uh, this is from Huffington Post Obama admits I was born in Morocco it's halfway between Kenya and the US Mr. Obama explains so in the spirit of bipartisan com compromise I'm going to admit that I was born in Morocco so, and his, the speech that he gave over here where he met with the joint guy was in 2012. So it was before he even made that uh, speech. So this attempt to reach across the aisle. So this was a joke. Like, hey, if the Republicans are saying I'm born in Kenya, let's just meet halfway. Okay, you get it? It's a joke. It just happens to be Morocco. Uh, the debate over the president's place of birth has dogged him for the first two years. Okay, whatever. Morocco, whatever. It's still not America. So that's the uh, Michelle Bachman. So now, I was wrapping up this post, and then um, in wrapping up this post, I was like, you know what? I might as well check, check to see what Trump did, if Trump did anything relating to Morocco during his administration. Because if my theory holds, then Trump would try to basically show even more allegiance, essentially, or devotion to the Moroccan monarchy than Obama did. And um, I, when I put Trump in Morocco, the only thing that came up was Ivanka Trump. She went there with Jared Kushner, uh, and they met with uh, women that own private property and, you know, talked about how good it was, blah, 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 blah. So I had given up at first, but then I decided to put a for Trump instead of in Morocco, Trump, and then just Morocco. And then I came up with this. This is also from the House Archives. Uh, proclamations. Proclamation on recognizing the sovereignty of the Kingdom of Morocco over the Western Sahara. Foreign policy issued December 10, 2020. So this was towards the very end of his administration. The United States affirms, as stated by previous administrations, its support for Morocco's autonomy proposal as the only basis for a just and lasting solution for the dispute over Western Sahara territory. Therefore, as of today, the United States recognizes Morocco's sovereignty over the blah blah entire, oh shoot, I got the whole thing, over the entire Western Sahara territory and reaffirms its support for Morocco's serious, credible, and realistic autonomy proposal as the only basis for the, oh, 
I already did that. How did that double up? I don't know. Oh, that's their typo. The United States believes that the independent Sahrawi Sahrawi state is not a realistic option for resolving the conflict and that genuine autonomy under Moroccan sovereignty is the only feasible solution. We urge the parties to engage in discussions without a delay using Morocco's autonomy plan as the only framework to negotiate the mutually acceptable solution to facilitate progress towards this aim. The United States will encourage economic and social development with Morocco including the Western Sahara Territory and to end and to that end will open a consulate in the Western Sahara to, oh wow I didn't even read this whole thing in Balkal to promote economic and business opportunities in the region. That's also what he did with Jerusalem, which is a lot of people, no one's made a connection to all of the shit going on right now in Gaza as being directly related to Trump turning, illegally moving the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Uh, now, therefore, I, Donald J. Trump, President of the United States of America, by virtue of the authority vested in me by the Constitution of the laws of the United States, do hereby proclaim that the United States recognizes that the entire Western Sahara territory is part of the Kingdom of Morocco in witness whereof I have hereunto set my hand this fourth day of December in the year of our Lord 2020 and of the independence of the United States of 200 wow well, and 45th Donald J. Trump okay so that was yesterday I mean I, I wrote out my whole theory here too you do want to check that out Now today, when I was at work, I was hoping to have a nice slow day, but it got crazy busy. So when I, the few videos that I got to watch, this was one of the shorts. And this computer is a work computer, so I'm not signed into it. So, it, I mean, it doesn't, um, what I was doing this yesterday, it was at home. So there was no, even though we know that um, Google's really good at the algorithm and determining stuff, it wasn't connected to this. So this is just a random video. I, I would call this Jungian synchronicity because I didn't understand Trump's declaration. Like, so, okay, he made a declaration. Yeah, um, Morocco's, the king of Morocco, basically he's saying the king of Morocco owns that whatever. What is that? Now I'm gonna tell you, I'm, we're gonna learn it together. Set of maps you see will have these places grayed out with no data. We've got Antarctica, Greenland, North Korea, Western Sahara, or SADR. But why is that? Well, some of them are pretty obvious. Antarctica doesn't usually have a demo. Explanatory to be it's hard to get statistics from them. Then the SADR is a weird sort of disputed territory, formerly part of Morocco, but it's still ongoing disputes, and I guess statistic makers aren't sure if they should include it in Morocco or not. 90% of maps you see. So, that looks like Trump tried to resolve that issue, but apparently that his, uh, his ego resolved it for him. And again, this is just kissing ass of a king. That's all it is. And just to give you some insight here, it was America was essentially founded to be anti-monarchy. Oh, there's a whole proclamation. No, that's not it. So in 1811, the American people tried to pass this as a 13th Amendment. If any citizen of the United States shall accept, claim, receive, or retain any title of nobility or honor, or shall, without the consent of Congress, accept and retain any present pension, office, or emolument, of any kind, whatever, from any emperor, king, prince, or foreign power, such person shall cease to be a citizen of the United States and shall be incapable of holding any office of trust or profit under them or either of them. 
the missing 13th Amendment. Now, this whole thing is written by a Jewish guy who's saying that this is a joke in American history. This is a from his exact paper that he portrays, this John Silversmith. Uh, Twelve states ultimately ratified TONA, not enough to make it part of the Constitution under Article 5 of the Constitution. Secretary of State John Quincy Adam, through President James Monroe, reported to Congress in 1818 that the following actions had transpired. Now, this is the interesting thing about this. I'm not, I don't have all of it, but um, just to show you here. So, ratification. You had... Uh, Maryland, Kentucky, Ohio. So one thing that this guy does in his thoroughness, he doesn't tell you how many states it missed by. And it actually missed by one state based on having to get, you know, the two thirds or something like that for the supermajority. But what ended up happening here is that it says that no reply for Virginia. And you see that little footnote 52? Well, in the footnotes, it ends up saying that Virginia now, what happened, so you started in 1811, or 1810, I guess, is when, when this starts off, okay? So you see Maryland's the first one, December 25th, 1810. So then a bunch of states quickly get into it. Boom, 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 boom. It's going fast. It's gaining popularity because people don't want to be associated with any king. They don't want any king to have the right to do business in an American economy. They don't want any prince. They don't want any duke. They don't want any, any baron to be able to participate in the United States economy because they understand that that old world money is is gonna corrupt the civilian society that was dream, the American dream was uh, you know meant to establish. So then you have the War of 1812 kickoff and that's where the British will started taking American citizens off of sh American ships and uh, Putting them, forcing them into um, service against Napoleon. That was based on the premise that according to English common law, that you can never denounce your citizenship to the crown because you're not a citizen, you're a subject, and that's a piece of property. So they were saying these American, these specific Americans that had ties to uh, Eng Anglican blood, they had to come back and serve and so they were kidnapping them off of the ship. So you start this, this war kicks off. And then, um, but then you see, then after the war, the states, they start changing the direction completely. None of the states that vote against it are prior to 1812. Then you see Virginia, no reply. But what ends up, the footnote that he leaves out, because he's trying to say that people that believe that this missing 13th amendment is bad or is real, is that Virginia voted to ratify it in 1812, but that that got lost in the mail, so to speak, and so they counted it as no reply, and that prevented it from becoming the original 13th amendment, so that people in the government can still serve and do and kings and monarchies specifically can do business in the United States. They can have corporations compete with American corporations and American small businesses and they can have contracts they can do contracts with the federal government. For the best example is that the in the UK, England, they didn't test any nuclear weapons in their homeland. But they tested they quote unquote tested which is, you know, they detonated basically 27 of their experimental nuclear weapons in Nevada because they did a deal with the federal U.S. government uh, for and leased the testing ground. So just food for thought.